Hello, everybody. I, I feel like Vladimir Putin uh, <laughs> distanced. Um, all right. I would get closer to. Do you think we can get closer? Uh, I don't want to do something that is forbidden here. Wojtek, możemy się przysunąć jakoś do Państwa? Aha, dobra. No to <laughs> nie możemy. Tutaj się przestrzega reguł w krytyce, naprawdę. Przede wszystkim nie dotyczy. Niestety. No, of course, of course, of course. So, Jason Stanley, the leading American intellectual from Yale University, is our guest today. And the reason is this book, um, which I believe is gaining uh, more and more importance today. Uh, it was released uh, directly before the war. And in my introduction, I uh, prophetically finished, I finished my introduction with saying that the most developed fascist state today is Russia. And uh, now it's absolutely obvious. It would be even redundant to say this. Um, but we have a great topic to discuss from both theoretical and empirical um, reasons. And, um, and I, but I'll, but I, I think there is also um, good occasion to talk about the things that we don't talk much recently because our attention is fully ar arrested by the uh, issues that are going on in Ukraine. So I, I, I mean by this American elections that are coming and then and they are they will also have a very big impact on the events in Ukraine. They can even change the course of events in Ukraine. So I, I think this is an important topic and we have a great uh, person to discuss it and the, the person that is giving every second interview even here to American media, not only to Polish media. Um, uh, so and, 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 and it's, of course, um, justified by the role Jason Stanley plays in the American public sphere. And also, as I said, so Russia, so we st we're going to start with the, with the presentation, not long presentation, but for those who uh, did not consume the book yet, we would like to give a definition, what we because the book actually is pretty surprising. Um, people used to say, or used to talk a lot about populism, about some extreme or far-right ideas, uh, but the notion of fascism usually was like avoided or was, was like, it's too much to say about fascism. And all, con uh, all connotation we have with fascism are usually um, beyond our imagination today. Unfortunately, they are getting closer and closer. I, I mean, chimneys of Auschwitz and like, all this industrial way to kill people. So, um, so of course, as I said, we're getting closer and closer to that. Uh, but five months ago, 10 months ago, in the moment when the book was published, uh, the, the title was surprising. Um, so, 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 so I would ask you first to, um, to justify the title, to define what you mean by fascism, to say what's the difference between w classic or 20th century fascism and the contemporary one. And then we will have a debate and then I will give you the floor to ask questions, give comments, etc., etc. I, I, I may, may, maybe one, one, one thing, I'm happy that we have Polish intellectuals, but also Belarusian intellectuals, Ukrainians. So it's a, you know, we have a very good composition on both sides. So please, Jason Stanley. Uh, so first of all, uh, it's, an, it's wonderful to be here. This is my, my mother's home city, really. She returned here from Siberia in 1945 and lived here until 1948. So uh, I've heard much about Warsaw. It was a rough time then, though. So Warsaw appears in better condition right now. Um, so, it, it, but it's wonderful to be back. Um, uh, well, back. <laughs> the, uh, so, uh, so fascism, uh, m the, the 
I'm going to give like a very brief definition, uh, and then I will uh, expand on it. So fascism is a cult of the leader uh, who promises national restoration in the face of supposed humiliation by Marxists, liberals, socialists, feminists, uh, immigrants. Uh, he promises uh, that he promises that he will restore national pride in the face of this humiliation, and only he and only his party can restore national pride. At the core of fascism is uh, is great replacement theory. This worry that the people will be replaced somehow. So in Mein Kampf, Hitler talks about how Jews are, uh, there's a global conspiracy of Jews uh, that, who seek to open the borders to immigration to replace the people, the Aryans, uh, by, by foreigners. Uh, so so fascism, fascism is this, uh, what you do is you, you paint your, your opponents as, uh, in t you say there, there's an internal threat in the nation. The, the nation contains these traitors, uh, usually Jews, but if you don't have Jews, you can choose uh, other people. Uh, I mean, I think Muslims in Europe are playing very much the role that Jewish people once did of a fifth column inside Europe. Um, and, uh, and fascism... Uh, so, so the I, fascism is fundamentally anti-democratic. So, the ultimate goal of fascism is to undermine liberal democracy, to to destabil, to to make liberal democracy seem like a threat. Uh, now, what is liberal democracy? I'm go, I'm going to say a little bit about that right now. Liberal democracy is a system based around freedom. It's about how we can all live together as a society, and work together in a way that we can solve big problems that you only can living together, but still remain free. Uh, fascism paints freedom as, as an enemy. Uh, so freedom is the enemy of fascism. And so it has to do this uh, indirectly, since people like freedom. So how does it do it indirectly? Well, it takes individual freedoms, like a woman's right to choose, a woman's right, uh, people's right to contraception. And it paints these freedoms as fundamental threats to the family, to traditions. Uh, it, it paints the freedom to choose uh, a partner uh, of, you, of whatever gender as fundamental threats to freedom. So it, it paints, so when you see like Giorgio Mil Maloney, who's, you know, that's pretty much an explicit fascist, right? <laughs> uh, George, the new prime minister of Italy, uh, and Putin, another explicit fascist, uh, the most, the clearest example of, of fascism we have in the world today. Um, they both rail against, uh, they both said almost the same thing. In Putin's speech about, uh, about when he, about annex, annexing uh, the various oblasts in, in Ukraine, he said, uh, this is a war against the decadence of the West. Uh, we're going to, they're, they're, they're going, the West wants to say uh, that you can't talk about mothers and fathers. You can just say parent one, parent two. That was exactly what Maloney said. Uh, so the idea is that uh, trans rights, women, uh, uh, LGBT rights are about replacing traditional gender roles. So that's actually a version of great replacement theory. Great replacement theory tries to say uh, your traditions are being replaced. You are being replaced. Democracy's freedoms are about replacing you. Uh, and uh, when, so when Hitler was targeting uh, various minorities, he did so because the minorities represented alternative ways of being, alternative ways of living. And he wanted to destroy multicultural democracy, the basis of a multicultural society, because a multicultural society is the basis of, of freedom. You can choose however you want to live. So what fascism does is it represents these differences as threats, as existential threats. Now, now people might say, well, it's not fascism 
if uh, if there isn't genocide. Uh, well, just ask your well. So I want to address this objection at the very beginning. Um, first of all, it's easy to see how fascism legitimates genocide because if you say a group is trying to replace you, if you say that a group is a fundamental threat to your freedom to your traditions, you're representing them as an existential threat. And to represent a group as an existential threat is to justify doing enormous harm to them, as we see in Ukraine today, right? Uh, 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 Putin engages in genocidal speech representing Ukrainian identity as an existential threat to Russia. Uh, so, so to represent people as an existential threat is to justify killing them. But fascism need not be genocidal. It need not result in genocide. Germany was a fascist country in 1938, in, in, in summer 1938, before Kristallnacht, right? It was still a fascist country, and nothing ever happened. Uh, I mean, they, they, he, uh, people were being, imp communists were being imprisoned and targeted. You can tell co fascist politics because it, it, it represents ordinary liberals as communists. Um, it says that anyone who pushes for, for, in my country, for equal rights for black Americans is communist. Uh, they said Martin Luther King, a reverend, was a communist. Um, so, so this is the structure. You represent your opponents as communists and you seek to jail them, as they did with Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. The FBI uh, uh, threatened him and and uh, was trying to jail him. They went after the Black Panther Party. Um, but, uh, but fascism need not end up genocidal. Uh, Germany, if, if Hitler had lost power in 1938, Germany still would have had a fascist state. Uh, Italy was a fascist state, and yes, they, they committed terrible crimes in Ethiopia, uh, in, in East Africa, but uh, even if they hadn't, they still would have been fascist. The British fascist party, had they taken power, probably would not have committed a genocide. Uh, and in my own country, my, my work is based on the black American black intellectual tradition where they have always described what they face as fascism. Uh, so the Jim, Jim Crow, the Jim Crow laws, which were, uh, which were the laws that banned the uh, marriage between whites and blacks, uh, the Jim Crow laws were the basis for the Nuremberg laws. The heart of fascism is to create dual citizens, to, 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 to say there's one privileged class, the Catholics said, and everyone else is a secondary citizen, uh, or the Aryans say, or the men. Uh, there's one privileged class, uh, I mean, uh, and who, who really is the, the real citizens. And the Nuremberg laws explicitly borrow from are Jim Crow laws. Uh, and it wasn't until, so my, my father was in Berlin during the Nuremberg laws and lost his citizenship overnight. Uh, and those were based on the country he fled to. Uh, so, uh, so, so fascism involved. And it's not a metaphor. Yeah. What? It's not a metaphor. It's, it's, a, it's a clear uh, uh, reprint from Jim Crow. Jim Crow, and also, uh, I, I, if I remember correctly, um, Germans were saying that these American laws are too radical. Exactly. So they a yeah. little bit watered them down. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Because we had, it was illegal for anyone, I mean, there was a time when the head of the NAACP, uh, a man ironically named White, uh, he, uh, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, he was black and he he was uh, raised in a black neighborhood but he was 164th black um, and so he was the representative for so because the one drop rule it was illegal for anyone with even a tiny bit of black uh, of black blood uh, to be married to a white person uh, and these laws lasted until 1967 so so yeah the Jim the Nuremberg lawyers my colleague Jim Whitman shows this in his book Hitler's American model the Nuremberg lawyers, lawyers studied the Jim Crow laws, and they explicitly based the, the Nuremberg laws off the Jim Crow laws. Um, and, uh, and if you want to talk about uh, fascist, so what, what I do in my book, just to conclude, 
before the discussion is I, I talk about fascist tactics, fascist political tactics, 10 fascist political tactics that I, uh, that I break down and, uh, in detail. So the first is, for example, is called the mythic past. You tell people you were once great and you have lost this greatness. You, you, the men were men and the women worshipped them and you have lost this. And why can't you get a girlfriend? It's because you're no longer great. Uh, and then you get people to think that, that they want someone to blame that they're no longer great. And so their anxiety from neoliberalism, their anxiety from, from the depredations of capitalism, they blame on this loss of greatness. So that's an example. So I go through these strategies. But, but, but t t t t um, tell us more, because some are so much appealing to the reality that we lived in after 2015, including even corruption as the you know clear or like very integral part of of of, of fascism that that you're explaining and giving some historical background to it or like the question of using the freedom actually, or pro-freedom language or freedom of speech like against the freedom or going after judges. Um, like you, you can really have an impression that what we have in Poland is a clearly fascist uh, party that we were scared to call it fascism or were not uh, aware or were thinking Fascism e equals to Auschwitz. So anything apart it cannot be fascist. And then when you break it down into concrete uh, methods or into concrete phenomena, then you see that taken together means Bravo is Pravedivost or like, you know, Fidesz. And that this is exactly everything, one after another, what we have. So, so um, if you can tell like m us more about two, three more tactics. All ten are elaborated here. W plus many, many good examples, not only from Poland or Hungary, but Brazil, India. This book is also extremely interesting because it gives a uh, lot of facts that are still appealing, actual, and, uh, and just interesting. Yeah, so, so I'm grateful to Poland for giving me nice examples of fascist tactics. Um, so, so the, the chapter on unreality, it talks about conspiracy theories and the Smolensk, the conspiracy theories surrounding the Sol Sol Slomans Smolensk tragedy uh, were an example of the destruction of a public information space uh, where there's a tactic that you saw, I think, in Poland, although you guys can tell me better, uh, where, uh, where you say the, uh, the press is in on the conspiracy theory because they don't report the conspiracy theory. Um, so then you undermine the press and you force the press to talk about the conspiracy theory. So, uh, so Hitler would say uh, you, the press is controlled by the Jews and you can tell because they don't admit that the press is controlled by the Jews. Um, or uh, Donald Trump said uh, Barack Obama controls the press and you can tell because the press won't report on Barack Obama being from Kenya, uh, being born in Kenya. So this is, I used Poland in, in that chapter, the chapter on unreality. Um, the chapter on propaganda, I want to talk about that for a moment, the example of corruption. Um, corruption, fascism is a politics of purity. So the idea is, you know, we want to go back to a pure, innocent past. Those two concepts are very important for fascism, innocence and purity. So. You want to say, uh, you know, I don't know much about the situation in Poland, but, it, you know, gener across the, the world, you know, s say in the United States, people are saying, we don't want to teach. We want to make it illegal to teach about the bad things our country did. So you want to control the education system so that you don't teach about, say, complicity in bad things in the past. Um, be, oh, you only want to be proud of the nation. Um, and... Purity has this strange role in the politics because what I discovered in my research is every fascist campaign takes the form of an anti-corruption campaign. You know, you have to realize Donald Trump ran an anti-corruption campaign. 
I, I mean, that is like Donald Trump. I mean, I'm from New York. Donald Trump is the most corrupt person who's ever been in American public life. <laughs> you know, he is just, I mean, he has rolled casinos. You know, he is he is bankrupted his businesses again and again to get funding. I mean, he is just the definition of, of corrupt businessmen. But he ran an anti-corruption campaign. Uh, du Bois points out this aspect in, in W.E.B. Du Bois in Black Reconstruction, his monumental work of American history, uh, points out that, uh, that they took away black people's vote after Reconstruction because they said that for black people to vote was corrupt, that black people were corrupt. They corrupted elections. And when Donald Trump talked about, tried to say the election was stolen, he used that. He said, oh, in all the, these cities, the cities where there were black majority populations or large black populations, they were corrupt. So what, fasc what does corruption mean uh, when fascists use it? What it means is the wrong people are in charge. And, you know, and the, the wrong people are, have power. Uh, and so, so you use these charges of corruption uh, in the service of corruption. Um, or you use, you know, freedom of speech. My previous book, How Propaganda Works, uh, begins with a quote from Goebbels. It will be the greatest joke of democracy that, uh, that, that democracy's worst enemy won using its freedoms, meaning the freedom of speech. Uh, so, you know, Victor Klemper in, in, uh, in, uh, in um, Language of the Third Reich says the Weimar Republic, uh, the Weimar Republic, uh, you know, suicidally allowed everyone to say everything, um, which allowed, so the, the goal, what fascists do is they're for free speech in order to, so they can, use this sort of anti-democratic politics, this way of representing, you know, create, saying there's an internal enemy uh, that is destroying a threat to our traditions um, in order to gain power. And then when they gain power, you know, uh, they, they end it. So I always say, you know, uh, liberals say to me, well, you know, we have to give everyone free speech because, you know, we have to set a precedent. But Fascists don't care about precedent, <laughs> so they'll use free speech and then they'll freely just remove it. So, uh, so this free speech in order to gain power to end free speech is just classic right now. Um, why why uh, fascists are so sexually ob obsessed? Ah, uh, yes. So, uh, fascism always surrounds. Is, is sort of based on sexual anxiety. Uh, I mean, um, uh, Wilhelm Reich uh, uh, very early on uh, n uh, describes this aspect of, of fascism, that fascism involves uh, you know, this macho leader who's the father of the nation. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, there's a, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the, you know, whether Hitler was macho. He actually wasn't personally that macho. He wasn't like Mussolini. Uh, and now what you're seeing with, uh, in France with Le Pen, the various Le Pens, and with Maloney, is you're seeing fascism with a woman's face. But fascism is always very strict about gender roles. Um, the, one of the first things the Nazis did, the first book burning, was Magnus Hirschfeld's gender transition clinic. Um, Magnus Hirschfeld was a doctor who, who was exploring gender transition and trans identity. And the Nazis burned his clinic because this division between genders is central. You know, in fascism, men are men, women are at home. I mean, the Nazis were the most anti-feminist, uh, 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 anti-feminist um, government in the 20th century. Uh, maybe the Taliban r rivaled them. Um, so, so the idea is so fascism is targeting freedoms and. Uh, you, if you can represent women's freedom or the freedom of sexual minorities as a threat to manhood, then, uh, then you can represent democracy as a threat to manhood. And then when you threaten people's manhoods, you make them feel very vulnerable and anxious. So you take advantage of that as a way to make them feel that, 
that they need a strong leader. And like moving into what we have now in Russia, or I would I would also ask you about the the, the issue of rape because this is also something that plays very important role in all fascist movements. Yeah, you're writing about it. Yeah, the the uh, so first of all, you 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 represent the. Uh, so fascism involves projection, constant projection. I just had an interview with USA Today where they're like, why are the Republicans calling the Democrats fascists? And, and I said, that's because they're projecting. They're, they're saying, calling the enemy what they are. And with rape... They also are talking about a lot about law and justice or, or the rules, or yes. Right. This is, they this themselves is... are violating the rules. Yeah, that's, that's the chapter on law and order. Um, when you know the fashion, but let's let's take rape for for so the idea is always that um, uh, let 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 me begin with U.S. history and lynching, um, li the campaign against black men, uh, w th where thousands and thousands of black men were lynched because they were supposedly raping white women, um, is a class is a is is just a, a classic here. I mean, you have to realize that Hitler is very affected. By America, he's read Madison Grant's 1916, *The Passing of the Great Race*, which is an American eugenics volume, and America was sort of dominated by this idea that black men were rape, raping white women. Um, and as uh, you know, um, even though you know, as Angela Davis points out, even though every plantation was run by a black man and a white woman during the Civil War, and there was no cases of rape. <laughs> Uh, th this was so the idea is to paint the other as a threat to your family as a threat to your uh, as a threat to your uh, you, you know it, the, the idea is if black men are allowed to have children with white women or pair up with white women you might have mixed races and therefore destroy the, the, the white race uh, so uh, so Ida B. Wells is is very in her great book, 1892 book, Southern Horrors, is very clear about this, that first of all, it's this whole uh, rape myth is, sac is patriarchal because it's saying white women cannot choose to be with, with white men. So you can't disentangle racism, anti-immigration sentiment with, from patriarchy. They're all connected. Um, Ida B. Wells is very good on this. And secondly, uh, and really this comes up in Russia, um, uh, and also with the Nazis. So, so Hitler is very clear. He says Jews are raping Aryan women or seducing Aryan women. Um, but uh, Ida B. Wells points out what's actually happening in the South is that white men are raping black women in large numbers and they're getting away with it and there's no punishment at all. So the politics says... This, is, this was actually one of the key... Um, uh, dimension of uh, slavery, of which actually is not, it, it, it's not a part of definition today, but this is exactly what was a, like, like key pillar of, of, of slavery and one of the worst things that, that sl slavery or like serfdom included, correct? Uh, absolutely. You have to imagine, and, and it's also a way you can see how hellish for everyone tyranny is. Uh, this is a point Hortense Spillers, uh, the, the, uh, the literary theorist, makes. Imagine being in a slaveholder, being the wife of a slaveholder, of an enslaver. Your husband is, rape, is constantly raping uh, women that he has enslaved. I mean, that is a horrific life for everyone. Uh, uh, so the nightmare of, of a slaveocracy. Um, and and in, in slavery... Anyone born, you know, the, the master's children were just more property, and each enslaved person was more valuable. So slavery was incent slavery incentivized rape. And how how would you connect the rape as a war strategy of Russians to 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 this? Yeah. So so uh, so the idea is uh, uh, well. They are trying to destroy the Ukrainian people. They're trying to. It's part of genocide. Rape is is a part of is an act of genocide. Uh, so, uh, so the the um, you know the 
the classic thing of claiming that your opposition opponent, the claiming that that the scapegoat you're trying to attack is raping, and then raping their women, uh, is uh, is it's a classic structure. Uh, you can also think of the Nazis and Jewish women. Um, so, but what's happening now is part of genocide. It's 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 really. I mean, genocide can occur independently of fascism, and rape as a weapon of war is being used to uh, extinguish U U Ukrainian people and Ukrainian identity, as well as kidnapping children uh, and placing them in Russian families. It's it's uh, it's it's utterly nightmarish. And uh, kidnapping or arresting and displacing. Uh, millions of Ukrainians and putting yeah. them in the four east regions like Sakhalin. Yeah. And, and, and how is that possible um, that, um, that we have it again? Uh, there is a chapter in your book when you're writing and this is openly saying that um, the first place when you, when you can expect uh, fascism is the empire in decline, correct? Could you elaborate more on it? Yeah, the empire in decline is uh, an easy way to build up the, this, this idea of loss, this idea of loss. You say, we were humiliated, we lost. Orban, when, even when he first ran, you know, when I was in, I was in, I started my book and working on this topic when I was in uh, Budapest in 2000, in 2010, in the summer, and Orban had just won, and everyone was talking about Trianon. And as an American, I was like, what's Trianon? <laughs> but, and why is it relevant now? <laughs> but it was this idea of lost greater Hungary. So this idea of loss, you want to generate, in fascist politics, you want to generate this feeling of humiliation. Because you want to say, oh, you've been humiliated. You've been emasculated. You've been humiliated as a man. You've been emasculated. So you need a real man to come and give you your manhood back. And if you've lost a portion of your country, that's a very easy way to claim emasculation. It's a very easy way to, to get people to feel national humiliation. So with Russia, it's very clear that we have this kind of classic Versailles, post-Versailles, you know, Gorbachev and subsequent events lost us our empire and we rightfully deserve this empire and I'm going to show our manhood by regaining this empire. And you can see like how insane the politics is because you're like, Putin, you're the richest man on earth. You know, you've got all these different girlfriends. You've got girl, a uh, great girlfriend or whatever. You're doing well. Like, what's you? Know, what are you doing? But this kind of ideology, you see that you see the way ideology can 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 change world events like this. Um, but so Putin, I think, is taken over by this idea of restoration of empire. Uh, as well as, and he wants to also represent himself as the leader of global fascism. And that's what his attack on the West vocabulary is about. And this is why he created this kind of a new comintern or kind of a nuts mintern, uh, financing all these far right parties, gathering them, uh, not like m making them addicted to you, to your money and everything. Um, yeah, that's true. So all these theories that uh, the, the system that Putin built in Russia was like kleptocracy was too romantic, actually. It was not about kleptocracy. It was much more about ideology or like about imperialism, about something that doesn't have much in common with how much money you want to have. Yeah? yeah. I, I, that's a great insight, Svavik. Um, that's that's great. You. That Because you could see... For a while, you could see Putin, until the Ukraine invasion, as a kind of Orban, a kind of open cynic who's just doing this. You know, Orban is just making himself rich. There's nothing else to Orban. He is just enjoying his power and his massive amount of money. Uh, but so you could see Putin is doing that. So, but 
the invasion of Ukraine really changed it. It made you see, I think, that there's a deeper thing, that the kleptocracy was, as it you said. It was a part of kind of an appeasement, yeah? Or like, on, and, or even self-appeasement, yeah? It was, it, it, it was uh, giving kind of a comfort, yeah? yeah. Correct? Complacency that, that, that we, um, it's, it's better to go to bed with the idea that it's only about money, yeah? I think that's a deep and profound insight. Um, I think you know Put Putin was, and it could happen with Orban. Um, I was talking to a journalist today who said, "Well, you know, you wouldn't be being interviewed by journalists in Hungary, <laughs> which is true. Like, there's no free press in Hungary anymore. So, you know, Poland still has a free press. Um, so Orban, as he gets more powerful, uh, you know, Orban is." courted by the American right. They've seen what he does in Hungary. He really got rid of the free press. He really, in, in the middle of Europe, or okay, at the outskirts of Europe, but inside Europe, he did something that's not supposed to happen in Europe. He got rid of the free press. And so he's a god in the American right. Um, and he did it without throwing people out of windows and killing people and imprisoning them. He just did it using the courts. He took over the courts forced the free, pr for, you know, if you, if you criticized the uh, Orban and his, and his family, uh, you know, you'd suddenly you would lose your newspaper to his friends. Uh, so, so he's become, the, so I could see Orban going in that direction. But Putin very clearly has now shown that it's about this fascist ideology. He wants to be, you know, um, he wants to restore empire. So would you say that we are not Hungary yet, and maybe we will even be never um, Hungary, or at this po at this point, uh, exactly because we lost this post-imperial sentiment to much greater extent than Hungarians, correct? Uh, that's true. So, so uh, that aspect is true. I can't comment enough. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know enough about how Poland feels about well, lost lands to, in to, Ukraine. To, to, put, to, to, make it, to make long story short, um, even for nationalists, or let's say p populists like peace, the, still the key, um, uh, or in the heart of foreign policy is this Gedroich idea that there will be no, like, no free Poland or not in, no independent Poland without independent Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, which actually means that there is a trade-off, very pragmatic trade-off. Let's stop talking about Vif and Vilnius and shifting borders. This is actually the main difference between Hungary and Poland. F they would love, they would like to shift borders. Th they, Orban used to say, "We are the only, the only country that neighbors itself." Yeah, because you know you have Hungarians everywhere around. Um, but um, but 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 so like and poles actually are scared by by, by shifting borders. Um, so 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 um, still it's like uh, you know we, there is no consensus about Polish independence in Poland. You know both sides are talking that these are they are enemies of Polish independence. But about Ukrainian independence, we had. Uh, it was shaking actually exactly because of peace between 2015 and 2022. Now they are scared uh, because of Russia. So it's sti so everybody uh, again like came back to this Gedroich paradigm, uh, which made us really much farther on this path to lose these imperial illusions than Hungarians are. Uh, so this is like I would like to 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 explain it to you like uh, wh wh why I mean not why because why it's actually you explain it in your book but uh, where are we in comparison to Hungarians on this way of like not to be in, um, empire in decline or to have this illusion anymore but coming back to Russia. Um, when I was actually writing this introduction and and um, giving people some hints about what to read next, like Sergei Medvedev's book about this biopolitics of uh, fascist, actually biopolitics in Russia, it, he, he published a book and you can read it in Charna, the 
Powrót wielk- rosyjskiego lewiatana, fantastyczna book, książka Sergeja Medvedeva. Or some other books that were like explaining or talking or elaborating on this uh, anti-LGBT obsession in Russia or this actually, you know, this, the, the question why, why Putin is like, you know, presenting himself as a macho, which was also very important. It was not only because he is like this, it was an p- integral part of his, uh, you know, his method, his methodology. But then actually we are, g- we are coming back not only to the fascism from, let's say, 1933, but the what what we what we have now it's the fascism from let's say 1940 in Russia correct right yes where you mean when when actual uh, genocidal violence is happening yeah I mean Putin is a is is uh, you know he's just he's engaging in every trope. You know, when Hitler in justified the invasion of Poland, it was because ethnic Germans were supposedly being killed in Poland. Uh, and that's exactly what Putin says about Ukraine. Um, uh, and Putin goes further um, to represent Ukrainian identity itself as an existential threat. So the very existence of Ukrainians who identify themselves as Ukrainians me, is, is intolerable for Russia, he, he, he declares. So would you expect uh, that it will move on to kind of a new Van Zee or some kind of a new, I mean, to the fascism after 1941? So uh, the slight difference is Ukrainians are not Jews for uh, Putin. Or Um, or not Czechs. They're not, right. The... the, the, um, they're Russians. <laughs> they're Russians who have been, l- according to Putin, lied to that they're that they that they're something else, and they have this supposedly fake identity. So, so you, 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 what you're saying is that they, that we shouldn't be afraid of new Auschwitz, because exactly for the same reason why Putin started the war, uh, he he cannot genocide. Ukrainians because they are Russians to Putin. Correct? Yeah, exactly. So, so we have to distinguish. Um, I won't use my philosophy of language talk, but we have to distinguish two readings of, of genocide of Ukrainians. There's the actual physical bodies, and Putin is not going to kill Ukrainian children in in a, in an Auschwitz like like Hitler. Hitler wanted to kill every single Jewish bodied person. Um, you know, uh, little babies, children, um, all, every, I had eight, eight great aunts and uncles and every single of my, um, and every single one was killed and every single one of their children. And that's not going to happen. Uh, Putin will steal their children <laughs> and, and, and raise them as Russia um, because it's Ukrainian identity that he's after. Um, so he'll make illegal teaching uh, teaching uh, the uh, Ukrainian language, teaching Ukrainian history. This is, this is the future he envisages uh, if he wins, which, he, of course, he cannot. Okay, but if we are coming back to 30s in Europe... Uh, Wait, did you say Pericles? No, no, no to Pericles. No, we can if you want, but... Uh, um, but to, to the to the 30s, the 30s. and and Munich, mm-hmm. what 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 is the clear distinction between what we have now and what we have at that time is that the the West went the alternative it's direction. It's not appeasing. It's not appeasing anymore because right. it was appeasing Crimea. for many many years. Yeah. Not only Crimea, Nord Stream two, like all this all this bullshit about like how interdependence will appease Putin and will change Russia, integrate Russia into the Western structures. We know it well because as a poll, I, me personally as a, as a poll, I, could, I, I was not able to be an expert on Russia because as a poll, from definition, I was not objective. I had to be a Russophobe. So um, you could be Bulgarian like Ivan Krastev, you could be anybody's 
Spaniard, Nicaraguan, and you would be heard, whereas as a Pole, like, forget it. Uh, uh, now it's, of course, it, 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 it's, it's not the opposite, but it's different. Um, but what I'm... Um, but then I forgot my question. Uh, okay, appeasement. 30s, appeasement. Correct, correct, correct. Why, and f first of all, uh, do you really believe that uh, the West will be consequent or, and, the, and, the, and the West learned the lesson of fascism from 30s and 40s? Uh, of course not. My country is a large, has a largely fascist country, and my country will become fascist. I think it's the most likely uh, outcome that the United States will turn fascist. Uh, half of my country has never been a democracy. Uh, it, the southern states have been one-party racial, uh, racial authoritarian states since the Civil War. Um, and uh, and uh, it, I think the most likely scenario when uh, the, is if the Republicans win in the midterms, which they probably will, they will defund the Ukraine war. So people, it's just a mistake to focus so much on Europe. You sure? I'm reading constantly that there is a bipartisan consensus about supporting financially Ukraine. Is it a uh, too romantic idea? Yes. <laughs> uh, so tell us more, because so actually th now you scared me and probably not only me. It should scare you, yeah. Um, so, uh, so, I mean, I think there was a, a moment when there was more of a bipartisan consensus, but I think that the Trump-style Republicans... Okay, but both sides vote up until now for they the did, support. but we have a lot of crazies coming up in the midterm elections, a lot of Trump Republicans. So there was definitely a bipartisan... Con it, Ukraine was something that split the Republican Party. But I think, you know, a Marjorie Taylor Greene is explicitly against f funding the Ukraine war. And you might look at Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is totally insane, uh, and, and say, okay, she, she'll never gain power. But... If the Republicans sweep the midterm elections, Marjorie Taylor Greene's wing of the Republican Party will have much more power, and therefore defunding the Ukraine war. Uh, when Putin talked in his speech of annexing uh, part of Ukraine, he talked about he he was signaling to that branch of the Republican Party. He's talking about Satanists. The West is Satanists. He was talking talking in the QAnon terms of you know. Uh, he, he was using their vocabulary. Um, and, and so many of them, uh, as you said, Putin has had this long-term goal of funding the, the, the right. I, I, I don't think, I mean, what's depressing here, sorry, I, I can be depressing. Um, what's depressing here is that um, if Ukraine wins, as they must, uh, it won't end global fascism, uh, you know, because they will just go on. Um, but if, uh, if well, well, they will prove at least that democracy is stronger, liberalism uh, no, is stronger, is more efficient. Uh, they will. Uh, no, they won't. <laughs> They'll just beat Russia, and then Putin will be one person. Well, you know, the lesson for the countries that are not um, in the Western camp or in the. In, like I mean, Russia, China, like all these five countries that usually support Russia in the global assembly or general assembly in the United Nations, usually have Nicaragua, North Korea, Venezuela, um, Russia, and some something and like one more. Um, but for all other countries, it, 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 I mean, they are observing this conflict. None, none of our – the United States is the most powerful empire in the world, and nobody in the United States is looking – I mean, people are looking to it in some vague way, but our politics is roiled by the same craziness that, that you know, it's, it's – you know, the Democrats are Satanist pedophiles, you know. How important is this topic of Ukraine in American internal politics? Um, I think that uh, – I think that it's – the hope was that it was going to become important, more important than, than, uh, than it was. I think the fact that some Republicans embraced funding the Ukraine war made it less important. 
uh, actually. Um, so I think there was a hope initially that you could align the Republicans with Putin um, because they, they should be <laughs> aligned with Putin. Um, but I think that um, you know, most Americans, uh, I, th I think there was, I think there was some, uh, th there was some anger about the sort of whiteness of it all, like like uh, around w w there's so many billions going to the war. I mean, if you we spent forty billion dollars, I mean, you could reconstruct Haiti with that money. Um, so uh, so there were, there's that attitude, like what are we doing spending? so much money, the titanic amounts of money. Um, and, uh, and, and those are legitimate questions. Can, can you tell us, like, um, what's the decision-making process? How much depends on the president? How much depends on the Congress? Uh, co Congress has to vote to, to allow the funds. So, uh, so, you know, you need to be watching the midterm elections. <laughs> uh, they can defund the war. And the Land Lease Act? What? Land Lease Act doesn't give certain... Oh, I, thi I think the money... I, so I don't know. I, it's a good question. I don't know. Uh, they can cut off further funding. So there's a lot of funding, a huge amount of funding going to the war. And my hope is that, my hope is that the world gets together and Europe does its part. Um, uh, I mean... I. Uh, do, you know, I, I think Europe is going to have to do more, uh, and you can't just depend on the United States. And that's going to be true going forward. And going forward, as our country tilts away from democracy and becomes uh, becomes a far right uh, state, one party state, uh, Europe is going to have to step step up and be the standard bearer for democracy. Um, uh, Hopefully, Lula can win in Brazil. We have an enormously important election in Brazil. Um, if Bolsonaro wins in Brazil, it's a terrible sign for the world. The Amazon, the, the health of the Amazon will depend on the future of the Brazilian elections. The, in, literally the most important. <laughs> uh, those are the lungs of the earth. So, uh, so we have these two elections coming up, the Brazil's election and the United States' election. And both of these elections are really important. If Lula wins, it's a real chain, game changer. It means a, 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 a much quicker advancement of the climate emergency is cut off um, because Bolsonaro is destroying the Amazon at, at a pace that is far faster. And so you might not be paying attention to that in Europe, but the world, is, the climate is paying attention to it. So that's an incredibly important election. Um, uh, but I think that the and, uh, 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 Europe will have to do more. Well, <laughs> I, I agree, actually, or I cannot agree more, but uh, here I'm, a pe I'm a rather a pessimist. Uh, mm, but because it, if, it, if it hasn't happened uh, until yet, then, then why would we, and also, Europe is disarmed. I mean, when when f when uh, when the French uh, were close to making a decision that yes, we're going to give more because they were strongly criticized and even mocked mm. that they are completely inactive. They realized that they uh, they would give more and they gave like eight Caesar howitzers, but then they realized it's actually twenty five percent of what we have. Uh, you know, Brits, they have 200 tanks, 200. Poland will soon have uh, about 1,500, I mean, and we sent 200 to, to Ukraine. So we, we sent exactly, I'm talking about Great Britain, superpower. So, I mean, and it's a similar story with France, similar story with, with, with Germany. Uh, so Europe doesn't have this capacity, doesn't have this, you know, I mean, just don't rely on Europe much. Uh, th this would be my message to you. But um, um, so, would you? Would you? Are you? An, are you a pessimist concerning Ukraine and the scenarios for Ukraine? Uh, well, Ukraine has to win. So there's no other. You, I mean, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for fighting global fascism. Putin must be stopped. Ukraine must win. But even if Ukraine wins, if Jair Bolsonaro wins in Brazil, 
if the Republicans take over the United States, you know. And what is the role of India? Because you're writing a lot about India, and India is like one of the key players. Now they are supporting uh, Russia, m maybe less and less, but they 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 at, at least they abstained, yeah. Um, and again, uh, they have also some, or what evolved there, gathers certain features of what you are describing as fascist ideology, correct? <laughs> yeah. I mean, my I have enormous fears about India. Uh, Rana Ayub, their great journalist, is you know being brought up on charges, so the Russian tactic of targeting journalists uh, for for arrest. They, she was under house arrest, I believe, for a while. Now she's in the United States. Uh, the worry about India is genocide is mass genocide that will make all other genocides look small in comparison of the Muslim population. Um, so uh, the hate. Would you say that other countries are waiting on the developments in in Ukraine because they actually have their own wish? to genocide certain minorities or to act like f to have final solution of Uyghurs, final solutions of many, many ethnic um, um, tensions, especially in India, yeah? Yeah. when we have 200 eth ethnicities yeah, that are completely unknown um, and like nobody even watches it. Right, so the particular thing in India is Hindu nationalism. Uh, and the targeting of Muslims, who are not a different ethnicity. There's Muslims of each ethnicity. So it's a slightly different structure. It, it reminds one a little bit of... of uh, right, so... Okay, what I meant by this is that you have many, many various kinds of indigenous in people in India. And it's... I mean, they are completely defenseless. They are powerless. Yeah, th what's happening in India now is they're setting up to... Uh, take away the citizenship of tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, and that there's about 210 million Mus Muslims. They're setting up to take away citizenship. Uh, they've got two laws, the Citizenship Amendment Act uh, and the National Registry. And the way they work is this, the Citizenship Amendment, the National Registry is a registry so that uh, everyone with papers to show that they're citizens can uh, officially become citizens. Now, one thing to know about India is most, many people in India have no papers. Um, and the, the Citizenship Amendment Act says that any Hindu can immediately get citizenship. So that means if you put those two together, that a Hindu, Hindus without papers can become citizens. But if you're Muslim without papers, you... you you have no route to citizenship. And the idea is they're really Bangladeshi immigrants. Okay, my last question to you, because I'm still looking for like some positive scenarios okay. for Ukraine. And maybe indirectly there is one. I, I, even for Republicans, it would be not easy to digest the fact that if Russia wins, it's a good news for China, it's a good news for Iran, it's a good news for some other countries that are very hostile, or Republicans are very hostile to them. Maybe this way we can expect some support for Ukraine, correct? Right. So you have the split. In, in America, in the America First movement in the 1930s was against intervention. They were isolationists. They were against America entering the Second World War. Ameri the American fascist movements have been isolationist. The neoconservatives... They were that close to win presidential elections, correct? Exactly. There was a Philip Roth, a very good book, about the presidential candidate, the pilot. Charles the, Lindbergh. The, the first pilot that uh, flew through the Atlantic Ocean, correct? Yes, Charles Lindbergh, a great hero of America, who was a fascist. Who was and he was on very good way to win, win presidential elections, yes? Yeah. So that, do you have this, like, not science fiction, but, like, historical fiction of Philip Roth uh, like showing that the United States was actually that close to be in alliance with Hitler. That's right. And they would have been in alliance just by staying out. So that's exactly what we face again today. 
uh, we face the Trump Republicans uh, want to keep us out of all foreign wars. And to be fair, we should have kept out of Iraq. <laughs> you know, that was a, a mind-boggling mass murder that my country did. Um, but the, so the neoconservatives, they're for intervention. So the neoconservative wing of the Republican Party. How strong is it? Um, it is losing to the Trump Republicans. Um, and as a leftist like you, that's a, I have two minds about that because I don't want to see my country do another Iraq war or a horror like that. Um, and the neoconservatives, I think, also support Bolsonaro and, and, uh, and Bolsonaro cannot win. Um, so Bolsonaro is like Putin in that regard and the threat he poses to humanity. Uh, so, uh, but the neoconservatives will think in exactly the way you do. All right. So it's your turn now. Ask about whatever you want and oh, you can. On, I'm going to put this on. So. And you can get answers also about like far, like countries that are really far and get the detailed knowledge about it. From Professor uh, Stanley. We have a question here. And let's do like the you know, gender balance version one, wom one woman, one man. Uh, thank you for listening back. And discussion. could you introduce yourself? Uh, just yeah, Julia. Uh, uh, I, would, I would ask you about actually um, the relationship between, um, not the relationship, but maybe the relation between Russia and the United States at this moment. And especially, what do they have in common now? And what will they have in common in the future? Because you said that uh, the United States might become a fascist state, and Russia is a fascist state, so maybe there is something in common between them now. Thank you. Uh, ab absolutely. Uh, th thank you. What is your name again? Julia. Julia. Thanks, Julia. Um, so Masha Gessen's 2017 book is very good about this. I think we have to worry about cr what there's a unifying force of Christian nationalism, of uh, you know, far-right Christianity, and the Catholics, for some reason, are entering into this. They used to be allies against it, but uh, thanks to countries like uh, ones you know. Uh, the, uh, so what Masha Gessen shows and argues is that something like Russia's 2013 gay propaganda law is, uh, is influenced by our uh, anti-gay uh, Christian, na white Christian nationalists. So there's an international Christian evangelical movement that is powerful in Russia powerful in the United States, powerful in Brazil. Uh, that's the movement that is leading the campaign against, that, that sort of pushes uh, gender idea, the campaign against gender ideology, the campaign against the LGBT, uh, with some elements. Of course, the campaign against gender ideology was started by the Catholic Church, but it's being promoted by uh, by an international conspiracy. I mean, they say that we Jews are doing the international conspiracy. No, it's the Christians, actually. Uh, the, the Christians are the ones pushing an international conspiracy to destabilize the world order. Uh, so that's the link there, is that so when Russia, when Putin talks about the decadence of the West, he's speaking to American Republicans. And the next question is, Come on, a gentleman there. Oh, Pavel Brakowski, the leading Belarusian intellectual. I'm happy that you're here. Thank you for that. Uh, sorry. Okay, uh, Pavel. Uh, and uh, in fact, I have two questions, but not one. Uh, and I don't know if we have enough time to such inquiry, but uh, I try. Um, at the beginning of 21st uh, century, in one of his uh, last books, uh, the prominent uh, Lithuanian uh, philosopher and intellectualist uh, Leonidas Donskis uh, wrote about uh, so-called invisible fascism in the Russian state. Invisible, first of all, for the uh, Western partners, for the Western democracies, but, uh, of course, uh, f 
for the rest of the world too. And uh, my first question for you is, uh, how do you think? Is, uh, is it a prophecy of a uh, Lithuanian philosopher about Russia or some misinterpretation of uh, such condition of, of Russia of the at the beginning of century? Not, not uh, uh, today, Russia. And uh, my second question is quite near. Uh, uh, do you see some difference between uh, fascism and nazism? Mm, fascism in Mussolini style and uh, some nazism uh, is in Germany because, uh, in my opinion, uh, now if we have some parallels to actual state, we have uh, the state of fascism, not in Russia, but in Belarus, Mussolini style fascism. And uh, Nazism against uh, Ukrainians as new uh, Jews for Russian, as uh, uh, um, as in some speech of uh, Russian propaganda, uh, we will kill and torture all Ukrainians before they don't remember that they are Russians. And uh, in this fact, uh, th is there a difference between uh, fascism and nation for you? Yes. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Um, so the, the first one, I can't, I'm not a scholar of, of Russia, um, so I can't really speak to that much, but I can say this. Um, Nazism arises after the Great Depression, after incredible economic um, tragedy and difficulty. You know, my, my, my grandmother was living in Germany and pushing around shopping carts of Deutschmarks <laughs> in the 1920s. So uh, the 1990s in Russia, as the 1990s in Poland was, was a brutal economic time. It was a crime against humanity that capitalism caused um, that we don't talk about enough. Uh, and it delegitimized democracy because democracy was connected to capitalism. And my reading of the situation is that, uh, is that uh, you know, Putin's rise was was is similar to Hitler's in that uh, there was a terrible by by connecting democracy and capitalism, democracy was delegitimized, um, and and we don't focus on that enough. Uh, how terrible that was for the future. Um, there's also an aspect. You're talking about this shady '90s, yeah, that were like corrupt in Russia, mass murdering. I mean, like millions of people died of of starvation, of alcoholism, of, you know, food overnight, you know, they, they, everything was taken away. Um, so and we don't talk about that, but to me that was a crime against humanity caused by the West. Um, so, and of course it delegitimized democracy and it led people to support something like a fascist di dictator. Um, I, I think that ru behind Russian nationalism, there's some and the desire for Russian Empire and colonialism. There's always been something, f a fascist element, um, uh, a sort of genocidal element. Uh, the the uh, the it's not like a new thing that Putin invents that uh, you know Ukraine Russia naturally deserves to to dominate. That's not something Putin invented. Um, so uh, you know imperialism and fascism are linked. Uh, part two of Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism is called imperialism. Um, fascism happens when you have returning soldiers from wars who are disgruntled and angry like we have in the United States uh, with f Iraqi war, Iraq war veterans, Afghanistan, Afghan war veterans populating the, the uh, police and, and different violent milit militia organizations. So, uh, so when you have a history of war like this, then you, you, know, you have this, this uh, and then you have this imperial, I mean, Arendt talks about this. 
Um, so I think those aspects are present. Um, as to your second point, yes, the fascism literature is filled with remarks that it's hard to theorize Nazism and, fa and Italian fascism together. Um, these are difficult structures. I mean, Italian fascism is not by its nature anti-Semitic. Uh, you know, more than 10, you know, there, was a there was a large portion of Italian Jews who were fascists. Um, so I don't know the percent. Last night at dinner, someone said 14% of Italian Jews were fascists. Uh, I, 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 can't, I can't identify that. But you know, it Italian fascism was very different. Um, the German fascism involved um, big business supporting Hitler, Hitler drawing on both big business and the social conservatives. Uh, and his promise to big business was, I'll leave you alone. Um, Italian fascism was different. So it's hard to, to, to uh, I come from American fascism. I come from the Ku Klux Klan, Jim Crow, racial fascism. Uh, the fact I come from, in my country, uh, we in prison, we have a vast prison system that, that rivals the worst of the gulag. At, 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 at the height of the gulag in Poland, the, uh, the incarceration rate, the prison rate, was between 200 and 300 per 100,000. Our incarceration rate is over 700 per 100,000 now. So, so uh, I come from a country that has this history of racial fascism that is going on today. Uh, and, um, and, and so that is more like Nazism. Uh, but, um, but there's things like the relationship between business and the state that, that you know, um, uh, w we're seeing that, we're seeing... We're seeing in the United States, we're seeing, uh, say, DeSantis, the governor of Florida, when he went after Disney, the Disney Corporation. He's, he's trying to tame the businesses, bring the businesses under. under. He's, he's, he's going to charge Disney a billion dollars a year um, for, for not because they, have, they put gay characters in their movies. Um, Good. And there is one question from the gentleman there and so the lady first nie 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 to tutaj tak tak bo jednak we have a hello my name is monika uh, i would like to ask about your view of uh, how you perceive the difference between the uh, authoritarianism and the fascism, because we in Poland, uh, we still, I think, much more prefer to call our government uh, authoritarian, more uh, in the media, call it like this more often, and also I think we still uh, like to think of it more like the authori uh, authoritarian government. And what, what's the difference? How do you perceive it? Good. So I, I think of uh, fascism as a kind of authoritarianism, um, and uh, and I think my sense of what's happening. Hungary is a country I know better than Poland. Um, I think in Hungary you don't have you have um, a complete takeover of the press. You have uh, takeover of the courts, um, but you don't have you don't have certain marks of fascism like uh, killing opponents. Um, I think you don't need to kill opponents in Hungary. You don't need to kill opponents in Poland. Uh, this is unnecessary. And I think the sort of innovation now with this kind of right-wing authoritarianism that we're seeing inside Europe is that, uh, is that the violence of fascism is no longer seen as necessary. Um, uh, I, think that, I think that if Orban turned to violence, the EU would kick Hungary out. Um, because that would be beyond... There is no procedure. There's no procedure, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if Turkey, Erdogan, I think, is a more, is fascist, is, uh, you know, he's, he's imprisoning. But I think uh, Hungary is authoritarian. I think it's, 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 a, it's, you have to think of it as a matter of degrees. It's, it's uh, a fat, he's employing fascist politics. He's employing fascist tactics, shutting down the free press. Um, you have to ask with authoritarianism what kind of authoritarianism it is because there's a broad spectrum 
Um, you know, communism is authoritarianism, uh, but Cuba is not, was never fascist. Uh, Cuba is authoritarian. But what you face is not Cuba, um, it isn't what, you know, you're no, you don't face a co communist authoritarianism. So what kind of authoritarianism do you face? You face right-wing authoritarianism. Well, that, you know, tends towards fascism. And? Hello, I'm Yatsik. So um, how would you characterize the um, relationship between uh, capitalism and, and fascism? Well, now it's in intertwined, but would you agree with the statement that uh, when capitalism fails or demises, uh, we, which we are observing right now, then fascism thrives? And this is what we've been observing after the First World War in um, Italy or, or, or our Weimar Republic. And I think we might be observing this uh, process like happening uh, all over again. And, and, and then if you, for example, look at the, uh, at the countries, because you talk a lot about the uh, war in Ukraine. So if you look uh, at the countries that are not supporting Ukraine, let's say in the United Nations that are abstaining for, from condemning uh, uh, Russia, then it's um, China, it's India, it's South America, Latin America, and, 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 and African ch countries. And those countries were either invaded or, 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 um, by America or colonialized by, by, by Europe. So I, I think when I when I'm when I went thinking in these philosophical terms that that this war might be a war against capitalism at least um, capitalism as um, pr pr as presented uh, as preached by America all over the world because it's failing and it's failing even in the U.S. So wh where is it supposed to work if not in the U.S. first? Thank you. Um, good. Now, first of all, I think you can never portray what's Putin as and. Uh, Oh, and fascism is as anti-capitalist, though, of course, fascism is against any global structure and capitalism is a global structure. But because in uh, fascism wins when capitalists support fascism. Uh, so uh, the big business supported Hitler uh, because Hitler promised he would destroy the labor unions. Um, right now, it's not, and you still have that in America, like, in the southern states that are authoritarian, racial authoritarian states, uh, there's no labor movement. It's like illegal. Um, and so, uh, but now what you have are the, uh, the oil and gas billionaires, the oligarchs. You have the fossil fuel oligarchs supporting fascism. The fossil fuel oligarchs supporting Bolsonaro. The fossil fuel oligarchs supporting the Kochs, let's remember, are fossil fuel oligarchs. Uh, so, uh, so that's that the fossil fuel oligarchs are are supporting Putin, obviously. Um, so that's a difference between the 1930s. Uh, it wasn't the fossil fuel oligarchs, but if you have any kind of international cooperation, then there's going to be international movement to halt climate change, which is an existential threat to the human species. Uh, so, uh, so. Uh, so right now, fascist movements are being supported by uh, uh, the oil and gas, the fossil fuel oligarchs, and by the tech oligarchs as well, who just enjoy it. <laughs> they don't want any democracy to constrain them at all. So these are incredibly, these are, I mean, I mean Peter Thiel ha is running two senators in, in the U.S. elections, J.D. Vance and Blake Masters. Peter, Peter Thiel might have as many senators as the state of New, New York. Uh, J.D. Vance and, Peter, and Blake Masters are both Peter Thiel's little servants. I mean, Blake Masters just was his direct you know, right-hand man. J.D. Vance, uh, as you know, he sponsored us, he gave him $10 million to support his campaign. So uh, Blake Masters worked for Peter Thiel. So, uh, so, uh, so these oligarchs are... Uh, deeply intertwined with funding fascism. Um, as far as the global south, I mean, I think the global south is, you know, why would Haiti support uh, Ukraine when, uh, when you know, Haiti's been punished for 200 years for, for being, having a successful slave revolution? Uh, you know, it's upsetting to the global south, I would imagine, uh, for their lives and struggles to be so overlooked. Um, I feel that weight as well, um, uh, because I'm not 
European, you know, this struggle that is happening. I mean, I'm interested in Ukraine and Russia because of global democracy, but there are other global democracy fights. Um, I think it's existential. I think it's correct that all this money is going into it. But if you're from the global south, you can understand <laughs> uh, that you just reflexively do whatever, you know, you're not going to trust the United States or Europe. Okay, so either we have one question, three. So let's gather these three questions and then we have an answer and then we finish. Please. Okay. Hi, I'm Alexander. And um, I've noticed that we've been comparing the situation in the 30s and 40s with a nowadays situation uh, quite much. Um, but what would you say are the key factors that have led to the renaissance of fascism, of uh, the great replacement theory nowadays? Or would you say, is fascism something that has lingered in the political landscape um, internationally for quite some time? Uh, so uh, quickly, because we, oh, um, uh, on my view of fascism, it is a permanent threat. It's, it's something that's universal, that sort of speaks to our psychology in deep ways. Uh, now, it's not permanent. So Plato in Book Eight of the Republic says that democracy leads immediately to tyranny because democracy allows people to run for office who have no business running for office, tyrants like Putin or, or Bond. And, uh, and, but that was before Nash, and, he and he, when he describes these tyrants, he describes something familiar, people who say, there's an internal threat, you need me to protect you from the internal threat. Fascism is the contemporary version of that when you add European nationalism. Um, you say, you know, you have the, you say, the people are being threatened. The people are the true Poles, the true Hungarians. And, uh, and I think that that has spread everywhere. You know, India, uh, the Hindu nationalism comes from RSS, which was explicitly a movement that took Hitler's genocide of the Jews and said, that's going to be our model for what we're going to do to the Muslims. So it's, it's, it's that's, I think, as I've said, Hitler borrowed from my country. Um, he borrowed from uh, the structure of the Ku Klux Klan and, and so uh, the genocide of the indigenous people um, as it t t for, for Lebensraum, essentially. So I think there, there are, you know, y y y it's a permanent thing that you're gonna have to deal with and the goal is to not, not allow so much economic inequality and not to allow certain structures to happen that make fascist movements take over. So let's, let's get our two uh, last questions, and then we will have one answer to both. I'll divide it, of course. Hello, um, Eko Overbeek. Uh, I have one question. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the main critic uh, of your book is about uh, the use of the word fascism. When you read your book, uh, and I'm reading your book, and I'm listening to you, and I ask myself the question, what the hell does the, uh, the word fascism mean? Because when I read Paxton, someone's explaining to me what fascism means. But I have the impression that you put everything in this one box with the name fascism on it. I mean everything from, I don't know, the Catholic Church up to Trump, up to Hitler, Putin. If everything is ca uh, fascism, so what does the word mean? Can we uh, have a meaningful discussion is if everything is fascist? Conservatives, I don't know, racists, um, populists, etc., etc. If everything is fascism, what does the word mean? Right. So certainly not everything is fascism. Fidel Castro is not fascism. Cuba is not fascism. China is not fascism. North Korea is not fascism. The Catholic Church isn't fascism. However, uh, there are many things that are linked to fascism. If you look at European fascism, uh, you see that, uh, you see that you, a figure like Horty in Hungary is the old right. He's not fascist, but to say that Horty is not connected to fascism would be to misread history. Uh, the old right 
the old conservative right, and that's probably closest to what you're dealing with in Poland, the authoritarian conservative right, are not fascists, but they enable fascism. They're connect, they, they're, they're, they're authoritarian movements that, that enable fascism. There's, there's, there's discussions of, of, you know, was Franco a fascist? Like, or was Franco like an authoritarian uh, Catholic dictator? Salazar, Franco. Um, these are in the literature on fascism that you, that you allude to uh, controversial questions um, and questions of classification. But it's certainly not, you know, every country has a social conservative party. The social conservative party needs to be there because democracy involves people with different interests uh, and every country involves social, has social conservatives and they need people representing their interests. But when you start, when you say to the social conservatives, we need to smash the, the gay agenda, we need to smash feminism, our opponents are all communists, uh, we need to end democracy because democracy enables uh, the homosexual agenda, the feminist agenda. Homosexuality enables you know, the Jews to take over. Now we're talking about something that's closer to fascism. Uh, you know, when you look at Putin, you're looking at something that's very hard to, you're, now we're talking about genocide as well. Um, so, uh, so Trump, people said this to me, Trump is just using, no one denied ever that Trump sounded like a fascist. He certainly sounded like a fascist. But the criticism of me that is he's only talking. He wasn't doing, you know, they, like in October, 2020, Ross Do That published an article in an op-ed in the New York Times called There Will Be No Trump Coup. Uh, people laughed at the idea that Trump would try to remain in power. Um, but actually, as the history of fascism will tell you, listen to people when they talk. And Trump was talking like a fascist, and then <laughs> actually, uh, and now what we have in the American Republic, Republican Party is we have uh, these structures, I mean, Paxton calls the Ku Klux Klan the first functionally fascist organization. My theory of fascism is based on that part of that insight. Uh, and in America, so when you talk about racism, you have to talk about American racism. American racism takes the form of white supremacy, of, of, uh, of the great nation, you know, uh, 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 whiteness, um, uh, 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 and, and the structure and violent militias uh, uh, making sure that minor that black people can't vote, can't participate, are kept down. So, uh, so I don't think that that you know. I, mean, I think there are different varieties of fascism, but we need some term to describe the anti-democratic far-right movement that takes the nation uh, described racially or religiously as uh, as in existential threat from democracy's freedoms and violence as a way to preserve the sanctity of the nation. And that's frankly what you see in the United States. It's definitely what you see in Russia. Um, you know, we can talk about whether a country, you know, when you don't have violence, like in Hungary, you know, it's, uh, it, it, you know, is it fascism? Um, well, you know, there, you know, it's, it's moving towards fascism. <laughs> But you know, it's either Orban is not killing people, so so uh, you know, I, I I would say it's some kind of uh, uh, you know, it's it's not either or. It's a, a just like democracy. When you talk about countries being more or less liberal democratic, we can talk about countries being more or less fascist. Mm -hmm. And uh, last question there, the lady. Good evening. My name is Peter. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I have a question that's somehow connected to the previous question. Uh, what is, in your opinion, the key factor in the rise of the far right governments, far, far, uh, like fascist governments, especially in the democratic countries? Um, is it more in the um, ideological level, for example, like as you said, this longing for uh, lost greatness? Or is, uh, or is it more on the like basic economic level, like for example, Capitalism being unable to provide a good quality of living. Great. Uh, so, so I, I don't think they're disconnected because the ideology becomes attractive 
when democracy fails. When, so, so when you, you know, any theorist of democracy will tell you when you have massive differences but in inequality, when you have massive inequality, democracy is undermined. Democracy is weak. Aristotle says democracy is stable because it will keep the rich from getting too rich and the poor from getting too poor. Well, clearly, <laughs> that hasn't worked. So when that fails, alternatives appear. And, and um, fascism... Uh, what we have, nationalism, is a recent thing. You know, nationalism is a 19th century European innovation. And nationalism uh, is sort of allows a kind of fascist ideology. It allows the core of, of fascist ideology, the pure people. And it's, uh, in America, its form is white nationalism. Uh, and, uh, and that's an ideology that people can then appeal to when democracy when, when uh, the establishment and the system fails. And the establishment and the system has failed very dramatically. Uh, no one was in prison for the financial crisis. There are too many oligarchs, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much. It was very challenging, very interesting. Some points are probably controversial as I see, and uh, so let's express our gratitude to Professor Stanley. You see? And let me thank also to the translators. We Um, so thank you very much. Let me invite you for the next debates. I hope we will have them more frequently after, once we are getting um, more and more um, out of pandemic standards. So come here more often. We have a lot of interesting events and uh, I'm going to be more active uh, on this part and that part. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend, evening. Thank you.